Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to our program today, which is Drawing Disability, Framing Activism, Comics and Graphic Narratives for Interdisciplinary Teaching and Research, which is sponsored by ProQuest. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from Choice and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. Um, first off, for all of you joining us as attendees today, uh, please know that you should be muted and your cameras are disabled, so you don't have to worry about generating noise or feedback or anything like that. That should be all taken care of for you. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Um, and we are using, as you can see up there, the Q&A feature today. If you have questions for either of our presenters, uh, either Crystal or Dawn, please feel free to drop those into that Q&A module. Um, at the end of the presentation, we'll take a little time to answer as many as we can. Um, if we don't get to yours, we apologize in advance. Oftentimes we have more questions than we can get to, um, but we'll do our best to get to a lot of them. Um, I would also note that there is closed captioning available. Um, and if you'd like to toggle that on, uh, you can use the little CC button there in the bottom right corner of the screen. Um, also note that we are recording today's program and that everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link uh, to that archived version of the presentation. Um, and with that, we are ready to get started. So I will turn things over to Crystal uh, for a quick introduction. You're muted, Crystal. Thank you, Don. I was just about to ask, let me know if my sound is okay and you can hear me. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you, Mark and the team at Pro ProQuest for putting this event together. Um, and I appreciate you all for joining me today. So um, my name is Crystal Yin Li. My pronouns are she, her. And I am an assistant professor of comparative world literature at California State University, Long Beach. And to get us started, I want to provide a, a self-description of my visual appearance for blind and visually impaired participants, and also for anyone who might not be using their screen. So I am an Asian woman in my early 30s. I have long dark hair, and I'm wearing a bright pink shirt. And I'm joined by Don Kazmar, one Zoom window over, who will be presenting after me. Hello, my name is Dawn Kazmar, and my pronouns are she, her. I am a white woman with medium length brown hair and glasses. I have a PhD in English literature and language from the University of Michigan. I will be speaking briefly today about Jennifer Hayden's graphic narrative about breast cancer um, after Crystal. Thanks, Dawn. We'll look forward to that. Um, so the title of my talk today is Drawing Disability, Framing Activism comics and graphic narratives for interdisciplinary teaching and research. Um, and please let me know if my slides don't change for some reason. Um, so I'm first going to offer an introductory overview of comics and graphic narratives, what they are, what they can be about, um, and how they're being used in uh, current research and classrooms. In the second part of the talk, I'll share a bit about my specific area of comics research, um, which focuses on the intersection of disability, health, and medicine. And by the end of the talk, I hope you'll have um, a broad sense of what is out there, as well as how um, sort of a feel for how comics can be used to further different kinds of discussion around inclusion, diversity, social justice, and accessibility, um, including where to go for some resources for making comics accessible to blind and vision impaired readers. On this note of access, I have also provided a um, transcript of this talk in 12 and large print font if you need to um, follow along, which I think is um, being posted in the chat section, otherwise it'll go out after. Um, and I'll also briefly describe images in my slides and have book titles available in the transcript. Um, I also encourage you to move your body as you need during this presentation and be as you need to be. If thinking about comics in an institutional or academic setting is new to you, you may already have some questions. 
like, what is the difference between a comic and a graphic narrative? Are comics cartoons? And is graphic novels something else? The short answer is comics is a medium, as awkward as that singular verb sounds, like film, music, and painting. And it's a vehicle through which information is communicated through textual devices and visual elements like captions, narration, speech, uh, speech balloons, and symbols. In comics, time unfolds around the spatial arrangement of visual verbal elements like images or panels, um, encouraging readers to interpretively fill in the gaps between them. The term comics then implies some kind of sequential narrative, unlike a single panel cartoon um, that can be linear, like in this three panel comic strip of Garfield, thinking cats have many talents and then shedding and then profoundly exclaiming, ta-da, or comics can be multilinear, like this page spread of Sergio Garcia Sanchez's The Three Paths, depicting three different characters' narratives intersecting and paralleling each other. Nonlinear and translinear comics are also becoming more popular as comic creators push on formal conventions and boundaries of the medium. And this is an example of that from Richard McGuire's Here, which superimposes panels to simultaneously represent all of the past, present, and future occurrences that have happened in a single living room. Comics is also not a genre, though the term has become somewhat synonymous with the popular superhero fiction genre. Like fantasy, romance, and humor, the superhero genre has its own set of conventions, but comics can really be about anything and they don't need to be humorous. Because of comics close association with popular genres and comedy, comics coming from the Greek komos for drunken revelry, they can carry perceived juvenile connotations that many academics, educators, and publishers try to shake. A trendy media phrase you might hear in defense of comics is, comics aren't just for kids anymore. But this statement, besides being adultist, erases comics' long history of engaging multi-generational and adult readers and obscures comics' rich histories in pictorial satire, political cartooning, and independent and underground comics. The underground comics of the 1960s and 70s in the US were incredibly taboo shattering. So adult only, they were rechristened comics with an X like X rated. Um, and here are two comics covers, one that says hot crackers, salty tales for snappy adults and another titled love that bunch, food, sex, death, pain, romance, joy. On the other side of the ampersand, Graphic narratives is simply a more inclusive term to encompass the forms comics can take, whether fiction or nonfiction or somewhere in between, such as a graphic novel, graphic memoir, or work of graphic journalism. It emphasizes how the work of narration or storytelling is accomplished through the unique juxtaposition of text and image. The term is more inclusive than say graphic novel, uh, coined in the 60s to describe long form comics and today is often inaccurately used to describe all comics because of its more sophisticated or prestigious tenor. Truth be told, many comic artists are actually irritated by this broad designation that largely took hold as a publishing and marketing strategy. Attending to the differences between these terms highlights some of the diverse work in comics that is cropping up across a wide range of forms and genres. What I'll go over now are three major concepts in contemporary comics that I find urgent for undergraduate classrooms. And these categories are definitely fluid and overlap, but for simplicity, um, they include one, bearing witness to trauma, two, social justice, and three, identity politics. Comics as a form of bearing witness is a concept from comic scholar Hilary Shute. It refers to how comics, 
by virtue of their like materiality and ability to slow a reader down, um, has like this unique ability to communicate history and extreme experiences, particularly traumatic and catastrophic experiences like war, genocide, and environmental disaster. Bearing Witness through comics is about sharing in the author or narrator's experience of history, viewing life through the perspective of someone else, and coming out feeling a kind of shared moral responsibility for recognizing those kinds of difficult experiences and making sure those stories continue to be told and heard. One of the most famous comics that gets taught in this context is Art Spiegelman's Pulitzer Prize winning um, Mouse, A Survivor's Tale, serialized from 1980 to 1991, which is about uh, Spiegelman's parents' experience in the Holocaust. Drawing on the representational weight of animal metaphors, it's a great text for facilitating discussion on the construction of racial and ethnic difference and processes of othering. It's also a prime example of the way comics can act as testimony and counter archives, challenging dominant modes of storytelling and history making. There is a plethora of comics out there um, that engage this notion of bearing witness to difficult histories, such as Keiji Nakazawa's Barefoot Gen series on surviving the bombing of Hiroshima, Joe Sacco's graphic reportage on Palestine, Marjan Strarapi's coming of age memoir, um, set during the Iranian revolution, and John uh, Neufeld's print and web comic documenting Hurricane Katrina and its aftermath. These could easily supplement curriculums in history, political science, social work, journalism, and more. These comics give material form to the often inexpressible. They resist historical and cultural erasure, making visible for students certain perspectives that might otherwise be lost or silenced. And these comics also get at a question that Hilary Shute asks in her book on documentary comics, quote, why, after the rise and reign of photography, do people yet understand pen and paper to be among the best instruments of witness, end quote. So comics get us thinking about the relationship between artistic form and the ethics of representation. How do comics engage trauma, violence, and spectacle aesthetically and politically, and to what ends? What are our moral duties in looking at the histories of others? And because comics often orchestrate a sense of approachable immediacy or intimacy in gazing upon history and historical subjects, they can help students take in and reflect on topics they might not otherwise immediately identify with. For this reason, comics are especially useful for furthering social justice discussions and anti-racist efforts in the classroom. And here I'm going to discuss comics in support of Black Lives Matter. Some of you may have already seen this, but last year, the Black Caucus of the American Library Association put together an extensive Black Lives Matter comics reading list. And the list includes comics by Black comic artists from as early as 1941. Some of the more recent titles beginning in 2013, the start of the movement explicitly tackle topics like um, the institution of slavery and state violence. Pictured here are a few book covers. Um, Kyle Baker's Nat Turner recounting the 1831 slave rebellion, Tony Medina's I Am Alfonso Jones and Kwanzaa Osajefo's Black, both addressing police brutality as well as quantum physics in the latter. Um, and John Jennings, Damian Duffy, and John Jennings and Damian Duffy's Eisner winning graphic adaptation of Octavia E. Butler's Kindred. The Kindred is a text I always teach in my introductory comics class because it enables students to discuss the history of enslavement in the US and the affordances of comics in bearing witness to anti-Black violence and legacies of systemic racism. In brief, the comic follows Dana, a Black woman who suddenly begins involuntarily time traveling between her home in 1970s California and a plantation in the antebellum South. And through this speculative trope of time travel, the comic graphically illustrates how patterns of prejudice and oppression from the past persist today as literal and metaphoric injuries 
Athena sustains in the South, right? They travel with her into the present. So for many students, their sense of historical injustices, realness, becomes synonymous with their observations of the comic's portrayal of past physical and psychic violence in vivid living color. Students' analyses of color and the flashy style of the art fuel their claims to being able to grasp the weight of history and their process of bearing witness to Dana and other characters' experiences under the legal institution of slavery. And because of its visual verbal form, students end up having a lot to say about the way race is constructed in the text, the way power dynamics between white and black characters are portrayed and how visual metaphors of racism operate. And I'll show you some examples of what I mean. Here's a screenshot of one activity we do in class. I have students collaboratively annotate a page of the comic using Google Jamboard and the post-it note feature. And in this page, the artists use contrasting color and a parallel layout to powerfully convey the sort of power differential between the white character Rufus, who's the son of the plantation owner and Dana's great, great, great grandfather that is fed up with reading and the black character Nigel, one of the enslaved boys who's eager to learn that Dina is secretly teaching to read and write. And so this scene illuminates issues related to the forms of power that circulate in literacy and education quite economically for students. And I won't read the student comments, but I just want to show you this as an example of how generative these discussions usually are. Here's another example of a page we usually discuss because of the potency of visual metaphor. Here, this large tree splits a middle of a double page spread and three panels on either side depict some dialogue between Rufus, Dana, and her husband, Kevin, who is white. And Rufus here is ventriloquizing, but Dana points out to be learned racist and misogynistic beliefs about interracial marriage and female bodies as property. But beyond addressing the dialogue, students here have left comments about the tree as a metaphor for Dana's family tree, but also as a metaphor for these deeply ingrained racial and gendered prejudices, or what they come to call the roots of racism that are growing and taking hold in Rufus. And emerging from these readings of the tree representing the fixedness of Rufus's racism was one student's counterpoint that the tree by occupying the center of the page was actually in the process of being broken by the book's centerfold. And I would add, you know, the material presence of her as a reader creating this break. And so this feature made her feel optimistically that despite the tree, and these are her words, representing deeply ingrained racist ways of thinking, it could still be broken. I find this student's reading fascinating because it draws from her interpretation of the comic's material form, um, but also what might be interpreted as the comic's gutter, the absent space between images and panels, which is equally essential to the story. And the gutter is this site in which the reader imaginatively fills in the blank or commits what comic scholars call closure. And different readers do this imaginative work of closure differently, of course. But this closure attests to the comic's insistence on a reader's active and involved engagement, which is crucial, I think, for teaching social justice topics. And the student's response also reflects a kind of translinear way of reading that can emerge from comics, as I mentioned before, um, in that she comes to reread the tree from the position of herself, right, holding the book or the tree, representing history, and she takes that representation of ingrained ways of thinking into her own hands, quite literally, to say these cycles of racism can be broken. And that opened up into a class conversation about how individuals and society could begin to do that. So in facilitating discussions like this, I think the interpretive open-endedness and multi-directionality offered by the comic medium proves really important for giving students that space necessary for thinking about the possibility of social change. As you can tell, comics can jumpstart pressing conversations around race, and the scholarship and theory around comics available are equally valuable. Beyond foundational texts by Scott McLeod and Will Eisner, the recent work being done in, for example, Black comic studies 
can support students' learning and inquiries into issues of racial representation. These texts also shake up the status quo of comics theory, um, comics theory canon, right? Um, and as Rebecca Wanzo points out in her book on African-American comic art and belonging pictured here, McLeod's theorization of the universality of the cartoon image rests on the face of a white male subject. And Wanzo highlights how the possibility of identification shaped by the aesthetics within comics is more racialized than some theorists would like to acknowledge. And also on this slide is Francis Gateward and John Jennings volume, The Black of the Ink, Constructions of Black Identity in Comics and Sequential Art. So part of the work then in advocating for comics as resources for advocacy or talking about identity politics is helping readers become aware of comics and comics theory produced by creators of color and creators centering marginalized or minoritized perspectives and experiences in general. Cal State Long Beach, where I teach, is a federally designated minority serving institution. So it's really important for me that I, you know, my students see themselves represented in the syllabus. And I also have them um, create their own comics in class uh, as a midterm project so that they can also have the opportunity to author their own stories or advocate for their own um, interests and contribute to a share uh, visual archive, however unofficial that might be. So when curating a list of comics for audiences, just know there is a lot out there, way more than we can cover here during this time. And if you can't see this slide, a list of titles is in the transcript. Um, these are just comics ranging in topics from struggles for indigenous sovereignty to the history behind the Rwandan genocide to the ongoing Syrian refugee crisis. There are also titles pictured about migrant detention and Japanese internment, as well as comics on queer identity and the intersection of racial and disability justice. Which brings us to part two of this webinar comics at the intersection of disability, illness, health, and medicine. I came to comics from my background in disability studies, a field that looks at disability as a socio-political construction and cultural identity rather than merely a medical condition. And disability studies interrogates the physical, culture, cultural, and political environments that shape the perception and experience of different embodiments. So rather than focus on what's ostensibly wrong with an individual, the field looks outward um, at structural, environmental, and attitudinal barriers to participation um, and belonging. So you know, finding within disability uh, community, identity, and culture. And because of comics, visuality, and heightened sense of materiality, they can represent complex and often contradictory issues around uh, the body, both forcefully and subtly. My particular interest is in life writing comics or graphic memoirs about disability and illness, and the way they can challenge dominant narratives, stereotypes, and prejudices, and also help us think more justly about disability inclusion in social and health settings. I'll share some examples from my research, but first I'll give you a brief um, survey of disability in comics, um, an overview of some of the different approaches to this area, including my own, and then I'll end with some thoughts on uh, accessibility. So disability is actually fundamental to the development of contemporary graphic narratives. Um, scholars often credit the inauguration of the comics autobiography as a genre uh, to Justin Green's 1972 comic, Pinky Brown Meets the Holy Virgin Mary, a story about Green's childhood struggles with religion, but also his experience with obsessive compulsive disorder. The comics Preoccupation with spatio-temporal representation and ability to represent multiple versions of the self alongside different layers of narration make it a particularly apt medium for Green to represent his obsessions with time and space, as well as the multiplicity of interior voices he grappled with living with OCD. But even before Green's comic, the representation of physical and mental disability spans the you know, spans the Western history of comics, reinforcing popular stereotypes and prejudices about disability in any 
given era. 17th through 19th century political caricatures drew largely on visual markers of deformity to satirize their subjects. Early 20th century children cartoons and comics relied heavily on disability for comedic effect. Take for example, Elmer Fudd's speech impediment. In the late 20th century witness disability becoming a major constituent of superhero or villainous identity thanks to Marvel comics. And I don't work on the superhero genre, but Jose Alanis is a disability studies and comic studies scholar who does have a book on that topic if anyone is interested. So in this very brief history, representations of disability typically adhere to some predictable and problematic scripts, like disability is either a sign of evil or moral transgression, the Joker, or it must be triumphed by exceptionality, like the hyper-masculine blind daredevil. The problem with a lot of mainstream representations is that they perpetuate dehumanizing, stigmatizing cultural myths and fantasies that disability must be feared, pitied, inspirational, or overcome by some compensatory talent. Furthermore, they just simply don't realistically represent the daily lived reality and complexity of disabled people. Fortunately, the world of disability and comics has expanded, is expanding, um, especially since the 90s, thanks to the social and political consciousness raised by the disability rights movement, but also the convergent evolution of disability life writing as a genre and the countercultural tradition of comics. Contemporary comics about the body can offer counter narratives, work to destigmatize difference, and or function pedagogically, educating readers about particular medical histories, ways of living, or cultural views. And here's just a sample of graphic works, fiction and nonfiction that grapple with things like the stigma of sexually transmitted diseases, disordered eating, chronic illness, deaf culture, age-related impairment, and organ transplantation. And the full list of these titles pictured here is also in the transcript. Graphic medicine has emerged as a term to encompass many of these kinds of works. And it may already be a term that has crossed your radar as it graces some library catalogs and research guides already. I believe there are even graphic medicine specialists within ACRL like Matthew Noe at Harvard Medical School, who is an admin of the graphic medicine Facebook group if you're looking for more resources. But for those of you unfamiliar with graphic medicine, it's essentially a field that explores comics and healthcare discourse. It was founded by a group of physicians and scholars in 2007 and has since grown into this international collective and what many are calling a subgenre of comics that aims to improve health education, patient care, and the medical establishment by offering a more inclusive perspective in medicine, illness, disability, caregiving, and being cared for. The website pictured here curates a large collection of comics related to health, and there's even a graphic medicine book series now published by Penn State University Press. And works of graphic medicine in general can be really useful in health educational settings and literary classrooms. But I also want to point out that what has become canonized as graphic medicine, by that I mean regularly appearing in scholarship and classrooms, is a body of work and criticism that overwhelmingly represents the experiences of middle to upper class white British and American authors, as represented by some of these popular titles. Brian Fee's Mom's Cancer, Marissa Marchetto's Cancer Vixen, Ellen Fournier's Marbles, Ian Williams' The Bad Doctor, and David Small's Stitches. Emphasizing the universality of these comics and experiences can leave the category of whiteness uninterrogated and also a live discussion of the way, say, some populations must, must negotiate systemic racism in the medical system more than others. Whit Taylor and Chris Kindred's webcomic, African Americans are more likely to distrust the medical system, blame the Tuskegee experiment, screenshotted here, is one comic that works well in my classes um, for this topic. So when recommending resources to students or purchasing titles with advocacy in mind, it's important to include diverse perspectives or at least offer supplementary reading from who might be missing um, from the conversation. 
And it goes without saying that just because a comic is considered graphic medicine or is about disability doesn't mean it's going to be liberatory or progressive. But what comics are good at is giving students a chance to identify disability stereotypes or harmful narratives, and conversely, explore narratives that challenge cultural expectations of both disability and comics conventions. A few comics I put on my students' radar in this regard are The Access Avengers. It's a team of multicultural, multigendered, and multi-ethnic superheroes with disabilities that seek a more accessible world and Silver Scorpion, a collaborative comic between the US and Syrian youth disability advocates. In terms of my own research on comics, I have a forthcoming article on Dana Walrath's Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's Through the Looking Glass, which is about dementia as well as the historical memory of the Armenian genocide. And it's a text that challenges the narrative that Alzheimer's is a fate worse than death, right? Using intertextual material from Lewis Carroll to reclaim Walrath's mother's agency and validate her alternative reality. And part of what my article tries to do is show that if we read this as just about Alzheimer's or just as a work of graphic medicine, we can miss some of the more serious political questions that the comic is grappling with such as how do you ethically represent something like the memory of genocide? And how do we continue to value and care for people with memory impairment who might be the last eyewitnesses of major disasters in the face of this ageist and ableist kind of cultural imperative to never forget? And how do we move beyond thinking of Alzheimer's and dementia as symbols for political amnesia and social death? holding space for age-related cognitive impairment in our societies and futures. The other forthcoming paper I have is on Julia Wirtz's The Infinite Weight and Other Stories. And it's a graphic memoir in part about the author's experience with lupus. And in this, I'm looking at the concept of disability temporality and how comics can convey different experiences of time living with chronic illness. And I also read it as a text that refuses these sort of readerly expectations of, of spectacular narratives about illness, as the comic is really about cultivating a kind of aesthetic um, mundanity and capturing moments of idleness, rest, and just doing nothing. So drawing and bearing witness to like the boring parts of illness can itself be subversive. And the book is also about you know, where chronic fits in with capitalist expectations of productivity and how it magnifies vulnerability to misogyny and all other sorts of things that crop up quietly in the comic. And finally, my current writing project um, is about teaching at the intersections of comics, race, medicine um, in the era of Black Lives Matter. And in this paper, um, I'm arguing for future directions in graphic medicine that more explicitly address racism and police violence as public health issues. So I'm looking at Black comic artists who address disability, medicine, science, and technology in their works, but aren't necessarily read as graphic medicine, um, including the Kindred adaptation, Victor Laval's Destroyer Number no. One, which is sort of an Afrofuturistic take on Frankenstein for Black Lives Matter, and a comic series called uh, Bitter Root by David Walker, Chuck Brown, and Sanford Green. And this last comic series takes up racism as this disease to be cured by African spiritual and religious traditions of hoodoo or root work. And it's a text that decenters sort of Western representations of healing. And all in all, these comics can get us um, and students thinking about not only systemic racism and health inequities, but also reparations as a public health priority. So as you might now notice, comics do really well for advocacy when they're taught in these interdisciplinary settings or paired with readings and ideas from different fields like critical race studies, disability studies, life writing series, uh, studies, et cetera. And they can almost be employed anywhere. And for that reason, comics are often praised as accessible resources. But I have to also take some issue with that claim. So I, to conclude, I want to unpack a few things regarding disability and comics in terms of their accessibility. 
So first, the claim that comics are accessible is often used to mean they're easier to read, but this couldn't be further from the truth. The universality of comprehending comics has been challenged by comic study scholars like Neil Cohn and other scholars who have shown how reading comics actually requires a really complicated literacy, or as comic artist Alison Bechdel puts it, it's like learning a new syntax, a new way of ordering ideas. So the claim comics are accessible is sometimes wrapped in ableist assumptions about comprehension and of course sight. And if we can let go of you know, this expectation that students should just readily understand comics, we can better support them in providing the time and the interpretive tools needed to decipher them. And speaking of tools, I want to note the way the foundational comics theory we often use in our classrooms can reinforce assumptions about and values around normative able-bodiedness. So for example, Scott McCloud, one of the fathers of comics theory, illustrates his definition of good comics through the visual rhetoric of physical able-bodiedness. And pictured here are these very fit white figure skaters doing some very impressive maneuvers, um, accompanied by McCloud's assertion that comics at its best, words and pictures are like partners in dance. Comics can match any of the art forms it draws so much of its strength from. And similarly, Will Eisner, another father of comics theory, characterizes successful comics as being able to convey time in a normative fashion, such as when he says, the artists to be successful must take into consideration our perception, which seems to consist of episodes or frames. And Eisner uses a presumptive we here, assuming we all process and express information and time in a similar fashion. But considering neurodiversity, neurodivergence, cognitive and mental disability, et cetera, it's clear we don't all fit into the same kind of box. This page in Ellen Forney's Marbles um, productively explodes some of the perceptive normativity that Eisner intimates uh, with her depiction of a manic depressive episode. And she's playing with the idea of thinking in frames or episodes all together with these multiple chaotic outstretched limbs organizing her thoughts um, and activities of the day. So I think that having these discussions with students about what kind of language is used to confer comics value or legitimacy and who is imagined as an ideal or universal reading subject is also a valuable inclusive practice. And finally, if we're going to think about comics as tools for advocacy and as sites of inclusion um, and access in terms of readership, we have to address the elephant in the room. Comics are a visual verbal form and not ordinarily accessible to blind and vision impaired readers, as well as for individuals with some print disabilities. San Francisco State University hosted a really great symposium last month on adapting comics for blind and low vision readers, the flyers pictured here. And the talks are all on YouTube if you wanna learn more. And the panelists of the symposium covered the importance of creating quality audio adaptations of comics. And they also had people from the blind community share their experiences with reading comics. And Nick Suisanis, one of the organizers, has put together a wonderful resource on blind reader comics that is screenshotted here, and it's on his website, Spin Cut Weave. And the site also includes links to information on um, where to get narrative scripts of comics to be read or turned into audio, um, and also some information on how designing comics for the blind have led to different innovative forms of comics, such as audio and tactile approaches, 3D comics, and haptic or screen-based approaches. And here's just one example of the tactile approach. This is Shape Reader. It's a tactile comic by um, Elon Manwash, and it develops a tactile language rather than a visual one. So it looks all black, like a, a black uh, rectangle with a bunch of kind of um, textured shapes on it. Um, and certain different textures and shapes have particular uh, meaning. And the downside, of course, is that all well, these are really expensive and hard to create. So because of financial limitations, it seems like written descriptions are still the easiest route and thus really important. And I like to make this a topic of discussion with students. 
So one activity I do that helps promote inclusion is having them practice writing image descriptions or alternative text. And in this assignment, I tell them why writing alt text is important. I explain that you know, there's a practical impact right, of writing it. It serves as a cue for people with visual impairments and also non-disabled people can benefit from these two. Like if your screen, your, your Wi-Fi won't load any images. But beyond this, it's also just a great exercise for jumpstarting close reading and learning how to write succinctly. So for this activity, I'll usually choose an image, and this is a page from Batman, and then I'll just have them write a two sentence description and post it to a Google Doc. And then we'll go in and talk about what is important information to convey, what are the challenges of writing and reading these descriptions, and then finally we try to figure out together what might be a good image description and why. So in conclusion, I hope this presentation has given you a sense of the way comics, whether they're about disability or not, can be really powerful tools for placing readers in discussions about history, social justice, and also belonging. And the world of comics can help readers and students forge connections across different geographic and temporal locations, as well as life experiences that might be really different from their own. And comics hold space for diversity and difference, but also our shared struggles for humanity. Um, and on that note, I'll pass it over to Dawn. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. There we go. Oops, went too far. How do I go back? There we go. Oops. Sorry, thank you for bearing with me there. Um, okay. Before we conclude today, I just wanted to highlight one more additional work on this topic of disability and graphic narrative, um, and that is Jennifer Hayden's The Story of My Tits. Uh, the image in my presentation today, um, the images in my presentation today are screenshots of this book taken from ProQuest Alexander Street's underground and independent comics database. The image currently on my screen is a screenshot of the cover of the book. Hayden is depicted in the middle holding a fuzzy orange blanket against her chest. Hayden's autobiographical graphic narrative begins with her mother's experience of having breast cancer. Before being told of the diagnosis, Hayden describes her mother as appearing distant and untouchable, despite wanting to hug and hold her, and depicts her as a deer. This slide shows the panel where Hayden, Hayden's mother appears as a deer. She has the body of the deer, but her own face, and is wearing a sweater and a sign that says, no le mi uh, tangere, which means do not touch me in Latin. Although Hayden uses the deer explicitly to express a feeling of distance, it also functions to articulate an identity that lacks obvious visual cues. In her article, Intersectional and Non-Human Self-Representation in Women's Autobiographical Comics, Krista Quasenberry argues that the turn toward non-human animals and representations of disability and illness, like this one, function to visually convey the specificity of an identity that Hayden is actively constructing through the text. Quasenberry writes, Socially constructed identities are less widely recognized by visual cues present uh, that are let sorry, excuse me, that are less widely recognized by visual cues present a set of challenges. Uh, because the visual cues for identities deriving from, for instance, clinical depression or inherited spinal degeneration will not be as widely recognized within the broader reading public. The identity category for a character experiencing that illness or disability must be constructed at the same time as, is, as it is conveyed by the comic's author, end quote. Rather than highlight the multiplicity of roles that her mother occupies in the scene, like mother, wife, woman, et cetera, Hayden, quote, breaks away from identifiable human characteristics in order to focus readers' attention on less articulable facets or circumstances of identity, end quote. Because many illnesses and disabilities are not visible or immediately visible, the turn toward the non-human while retaining her mother's human face functions to articulate a newly formed identity and experience that breaks um, typical visual codes of representation. Later in the narrative, Hayden depicts herself, now later in life, going through her own diagnostic process. I've added numbers to each panel so you know which order to read them in, but I'll also describe them because I know they're a bit hard to see. In these panels, Hayden depicts her visit to a radiologist who tells her that she has calcifications in her breast. 
He tells her that they aren't all the same shape. They're pleomorphic, which makes them suspicious, he says. She asks if that means that she has breast cancer. The radiologist refers her to a breast specialist to do a biopsy. Starting at the panel I've labeled as number five, Hayden illustrates herself on the biopsy table and walks through what happens to her as they per perform the biopsy. On these next panels, Hayden receives a phone call about her biopsy results. It is a nurse that calls her and Hayden re realizes that she is calling her from a cell phone because she can hear children and splashing in the background. The nurse tells her that she has ductal carcinoma, which she describes as stage zero of breast cancer. When Hayden asks if she will have to lose her breasts, the nurse responds, yes, the effective area is too large for us to salvage the breast. You will ha definitely have to have a mastectomy. At the same moment, Hayden realizes that the nurse is calling her from a pool where her kids are playing. The narrating text reads, I realized she was calling me from a swimming pool, from a life I no longer shared. Upon hearing this news, Hayden is now illustrated as a deer in the same style that she previously illustrated her mother in. Whereas the nurse occupies a life that seems familiar to Hayden, she now experiences herself in a new unknown space represented by the deer. The repetition of the deer imagery connects her own experience to that of her mother's as a legible signifier of breast cancer. Graphic narratives like Hayden's The Story of My Tits are important for a few different reasons. From the perspective of graphic medicine, the narrative demystifies the experience of having breast cancer. This is helpful for people who are newly diagnosed or who have a family history of breast cancer insofar as it depicts what diagnosis and treatment are like, as well as how emotional the process can be. This can help readers feel less alone in their own experiences of breast cancer. Graphic narratives like the story of my tits are also used in fields like disability studies, which is studied in research in departments like American culture, English, sociology, history, women's studies, and other courses that focus on diversity, equity, inclusion. And that is it for my talk. So we will now move for the Q&A. All right, thank you both. That was really, really fascinating. We do actually have a couple of questions in the uh, Q&A section. So uh, Crystal, these appear like they might be um, for you. So let me just present these questions to you. So the first one um, was asking if there are any texts with which one could begin teaching Indian comics. And uh, that person means Indian comics produced in Indian languages. Are you aware of any such resource? I am. I am not, um, and I wish I was more, you know, well versed in that area as well. Um, but I think that with the web these days, you know, searching um, Indian language comics, right, might yield some uh, results. I think, um, but not off the top of my head. But I would be really curious to. Um, uh, to have be reported uh, to about that it was once you find um, sort of uh, text from there. Um, Cause I would be very curious to see what the comic scene in India is, is like in the, yeah. Great, okay. The next question was um, asking for a citation for the superhero disability study or slash book. I wasn't sure if there was one on the slide or that's something we can follow up with. Uh, yeah, that's uh, Jose Alanis's book, um, and I can, I can, can I drop it in the Yeah, you the sure chat can. You can drop it into the, the Q&A. You actually, if you um, open up the Q&A, you can actually type an answer into that question. It's way down, okay. scrolled up the very bottom, um, almost to the oh, bottom. Okay, here we go. Yeah. It's called Death, Disability, and the Superhero, the Silver Age and Beyond. Uh, let's see, Q&A. Yeah, and if you just scroll down to the bottom, there was a question from Janice. It's almost at the very bottom. Okay. Oh, yes, here we go. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next question is, um, can we get a list of all the comics and transcripts? So, yes, but the transcripts will come, but, I'm uh, oh, sorry. We, we, let's see. Can we get a list of all the comics you have mentioned? Most of them had citations, it seemed like to me on the slides, I thought. Um, yeah, but they do, um, some might be missing. The, the transcript should have, um, 
at the bottom, if you scroll to the bottom of the transcript, there's um, a list of all of the comics uh, that I wasn't able to, to say the titles of. Okay, um, but I'll also put together a cleaner uh, list that is more organized, um, maybe just a more formal, you know, works cited um, references. Yeah, I'll do that. That's great. And then we can send that out when we send out our follow up communications with all of the registration, the attendees and those who couldn't attend. So that would be great. That way, everybody, even if they didn't attend, they can still see everything that you used here with their mm -hmm. listening to the uh, recording. Uh, okay, um, so yes, we'll send out the slides and the transcripts. Um, can you recommend some Native American comics? Yes, and I actually will drop um, a link to a whole, um, like, let's see, a list. Uh, type answer. Okay, so um, this is just a general list by Indigenous creators that I've just typed in um, the answer to, but one of the ones I'm thinking about um, teaching in my class are either um, Sovereign Traces, Volume 1, or um, a book called uh, Circle Stories, which is more dealing with um, uh, uh, an urban context. Okay. Um, and if some of these questions are getting answered, they're actually, I can't see them from my view now. Um, let's see. Um, just... I'm fascinated by comics that depict people's struggles with mental illness, as there are a few that run in my own family. Do you have some recommendations? Yeah, you know, I, I really do enjoy teaching um, Ellen Forney's Marbles in my class. Um, it's one of the most, I think, um, it's a text that something about the style and then it goes really um, quickly. Like there aren't, um, a, it's not a, super compact like like this. I wish I had it on my desk so I could, oh, I can grab it actually. So this is Ellen Forney's Marbles and it has to do with um, manic depression. And you can kind of see the way, um, you know, it's just a very quick read to get through. And it's, uh, I think really good at getting students to think about visual tropes of kind of, um, depressed artists or thinking about um, mental illness and sort of uh, narratives about creativity. Um, so, so this is one I would definitely um, recommend just off the top of my head. Um, but also there are texts that are about um, like say, you know, David Small's Stitches, for example, is uh, not necessarily about um, mental illness like up, up front, right? But there's that looming in the background sort of with um, the, the family members too. So even if, you know, a book doesn't ostensibly seem like it is going to be about um, mental illness or depression or things like that, um, oftentimes there, there are these crossovers um, that you can find in them. But um, I can think of a better, more detailed list later and also send that in with the transcript. And there was someone else made a recommendation as well, gave a link to something that says the Graphic Medicine website okay. has a lot of mental health titles and she, re and she yeah. gave um, a link to that as well. Um, Great. Oh, questions. thanks, Patricia. Um, let's see. There's one more question about that. Can you recommend additional comics regarding students with learning disabilities? Hmm. Um, I don't think I know of any off the top of my head, but that's something I'd be interested in too. Okay, um, mm -hmm. let's see, there was another comment in here about, um, so I can find it again. And, and this is also um, why I like my students to do, um, to create comics in, in class for the midterm, because I, I often do have a lot of students with learning disabilities. And um, this ends up being one of the topics that many of them like to um, write about or, or draw. So I've had students make comics, comics about um, their experiences with um, dyslexia, or also I had a student um, create a comic about um, having uh, uh, diabetes. So um, it's a great you know, way to, you know, just not only teach comics, right, teach students comics, but also have them create their own comics so that they can start advocating um, for, you know, issues they want to see represented. And then um, it's also nice to collect those. And if your uh, library has the capability to create like a student zine collection, um, that, that can be a really cool thing for them to see their works go into an archive that other students from, you know, different classes can look at. 
Nice. All right, any, I don't have any other questions in Q&A, but I, I, I wouldn't mind giving anyone in the audience a chance to pose another question. Crystal, can you talk a little bit about um, your relationship with your library or your librarian and any kind of support that they provide to you when you're looking for resources for either your teaching or your own research? Um, yeah, so we just acquired you know, the Archie comics and also we have an underground comics um, uh, resource as well. And, um, you know, whenever I'm looking for anything, um, they can they can find it. Uh, one of the things that I find really helpful is that I've sent them a list of comics that I teach in my class, and they will go ahead and find the ebook versions of those comics. Um, because, you know, many of these long form comics, right, they're, they're quite pricey. They're, you know, $20, $15. Um, so they're, they, they add up and many of my students don't want to buy the hard copies. So um, the electronic versions, um, uh, having them in the university library are really helpful for, um, for, for students. Cool. And then Mariah also gave another link to, um, she says, Tessa Brunton has made some wonderful comics, many comics about chronic illness and gives a a link there, but here's the other question that I lost visibility on. Um, do you know if these comics are available in digital form for accessibility reasons, AKA alt text? Yeah, so, you know, what I learned from the um, Adapting Comics for Blind and, uh, you know, Vision Impaired Readers Symposium is that uh, there's a lot of comics that, that aren't um, translatable directly in, in these forms. So, um, Comic scripts are one way that um, blind readers are getting access to uh, these comics, as well as you know, um, uh, people that are working in um, the AT area or disability resources are doing sort of um, either audio transcriptions of them or like visual written visual transcriptions. Um, but that's that's not really my area, so I I'm, I don't know a lot of uh, resources for that. But I would definitely reach out to um, either Nick Suisani's or, or some of the people in that symposium um, that are in these departments. Um, like uh, at SF State, um, working on improving the accessibility um, of, of comics um, in digital form. Nice. And then here's a comment um, from um, Patricia Anderson, who just says there are a lot of librarians participating in the Graphic yeah. Medicine Facebook group, and people often post questions there for items they would like to find. Alice yeah. Jaggers, hopefully I said that last name correctly created a database of titles and she's expanded upon it. So that there is a resource there. Um, let's see. So there's one other question that seems to be hidden from me at the moment, but um, so this was, uh, so we've got about a few minutes left, but Crystal and Dawn, I wanna thank you both. It was just such an interesting um, session and really opened my mind and my eyes to the use of, of this, this interesting, content type and the, the great things that you're doing with it, both in your own research, but also in teaching to students. It seems like it generates a lot of really great conversation and helps students understand bias, address bias, and all those all the great things that we're trying to change uh, in our world today. So I appreciate all the efforts that you guys are, are making. So thank you for your time today. Um, and I wanted to thank everybody in the audience as well for taking uh, giving us an hour of your time. Um, and we will be following up with you with um, the slides, the recording, the transcription, um, and a nice citations list that both Kristen and Don used today um, to put together their talk. So either one of you two would like to make any final comments before we, we wrap up today? Um, I answered one question that was asking for my email address. Yes. So I thought I would just put this slide back up for anyone who um, wanted to contact me. And yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone for taking the time out of their day to be here. Um, and also, I just want to say, you know, there are so many subfields and sub sub subfields and different directions you could go with these topics. And I'm by no means, um, you know, like the expert in any one like thing. So I appreciate people who are coming on to the Q&A and um, adding, you know, what what they know, comics they know, um, because this is really what, you know, the world of comics and, and teaching is about is this kind of collaborative, um, like learning for us all, right. So um, thank you for the contributions that people are making on the Q&A. Um, I'm really happy to uh, keep learning as well. And so if you want to email me with questions, or if you want to email me with things that I might have missed or things I should know, um, I definitely welcome all of those uh, comments. 
I just want to say thank you again. Um, thank you to ACRL um, for, for hosting us and thank you to our audience members. Yeah. Okay, everyone stay safe out there and have a great rest of day and we look forward to seeing you on our future webinar. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks Mark. Thank Bye, you. Serena. Bye everyone. Thank you.